Hello, everybody, and welcome. Today, we are pleased to be hosting the fifth session of the Future Scientist series, which takes the format of a conversation between Alex Gomez Morin and his distinguished guests. Alex is well known to you all by now. He's physicist turned neuroscientist, and since 2016, has been head of the Behavior of Organisms Laboratory at the Neuro Neuroscience Institute in Alicante, Spain. Welcome, Alex. And a very warm welcome to our special guest, John Horgan, an award-winning science journalist and director of the Center for Science Writings at Stevens University of Technology in New Jersey. His books include The End of Science and Mind-Body Problems. John is a frequent contributor to Scientific American and has also written for the New York Times, National Geographic, and many other publications. So thank you for joining us today, John. My just, pleasure. <laughs> just a couple of Zoom rooms for you all, Zoom rules for you all. Um, we ask that you keep your microphone muted during the session just to make sure that we have a good audio quality. Um, this session is being recorded and the recording will be available to you all in a few days and the chat is active so please we encourage you to use the chat to ask questions or to share thoughts with the group. And with that I will hand it over to you Alex welcome. Thank you Eleanor and yes it's our fifth session and uh, I'm rather amazed and also honored to realize that, that this hyper object of science and our thinking about its future slowly but steadily it's just gaining one perspective after another with all these really um, incredible um, guests I, I get to talk to so thank you again for supporting this and it's a pleasure to talk to you John today and let's start right away because in 1996 you wrote a book called the end of science and here we're exploring the future of science so 25 years after your interesting and provo provocative claims there, I would like to know, well, how do you see science today? Is it really ending? And, and what were your arguments there and your vision there? And what, what would you ent entitle that book if you wrote it today? Is science ending? <laughs> okay. Um, this is a big question for me. It's something that I've been thinking about um, and writing about ever since my book came out. Uh, you know, it's been 26 years now uh, since the end of science came out. Um, it was reissued in 2015, and I wrote a new preface for them, for, the, for that edition. And I said, um, people always ask me, do I still have that crazy belief that science is ending? And I said, Hell yes, absolutely. <laughs> I believe in the end of science even more today than I did back in uh, the mid 1990s. And then I, I went through some of the major fields of science like uh, physics and neuroscience um, and uh, complexity theory and show, showed how in some ways they're in a bit even worse shape than they were. I think this is especially true of uh, particle physics, which is really floundering right now. It's still, some of the leading theorists are still committed to um, multiverse theories and string theory, which can't even conceivably ever be experimentally uh, confirmed. And there's a lot of sort of thrashing around and, and uh, looking for answers. But something really weird and unexpected has happened to me over just the last couple of years. Um, I almost exactly two years ago, I, um, I was trying to figure out what to do on my summer break from teaching. I've been teaching since uh, 2005 at an engineering school here in New Jersey. I had planned to go to Africa with a friend um, and go touring through uh, the wilderness of Namibia. And that was canceled, of course, because of the pandemic. So I needed something to do and I decided finally to try to learn quantum mechanics with the mathematics. I have always approached physics as a complete outsider. I studied literature in college. I took, to, took a couple of math courses, but they were rudimentary. I've always written about physics um, 
based on what I can glean from interviews and from popular accounts. Studying quantum mechanics with the mathematics has really changed my view of physics and actually all of science, and especially science that has a mathematical basis. I now see, I mean, one of the assumptions I made in the end of science was that quantum mechanics was part of our modern foundation of knowledge, and it was really solid and unlikely to change. Now that claim of mine seems absurd. Uh, science seems highly unstable and volatile because quantum mechanics doesn't make any sense. It's a theory that uh, nobody can really map onto the real world, whatever that is. Quantum mechanics raises all these profound questions about, about the nature of reality and about what we can know about reality. So that's really made me rethink my whole end of science thesis, especially as it applies to, uh, as it applies to physics. So yeah, I'm, my, my ideas right now about the end of science are very much in flux. Well, that's fascinating because um, to be puzzled, um, it's a very good state of mind, although, although we often wish to <laughs> move on and, and touch some more um, concrete ground. So, so already here from your comments, I would ask you three things. Let's see if we can do it slowly. Um, well, tell us a bit more about the maths. I was imagining as you were explaining this, the analogy of one, one's love for music, even playing in a band, but then one day deciding to study how to read and write music, and then that opening a whole new dimension of understanding, appreciation for music. Why, why do you think going through the effort uh, of engaging with the maths changed your understanding of quantum mechanics to such a degree? And I advance the follow-up question, how does that permeate to the other sciences, biology and neuroscience and so on. But let's just stick with that one. What's special about the maths? I mean, I'm a theoretical physicist. I, I appreciate the maths so much, but it's interesting to, to have somebody learn them later on and, and what that can do retrospectively. Yeah, late, later on is an understatement for me. <laughs> Here I am at this late stage and I'm trying to understand uh, linear algebra, vectors and matrices, and to get a, a grasp of differential equations so that I can understand the Schrodinger equation. So here's, here's what I've concluded over the last two years since my project uh, began. The way I look at, um, at quantum mechanics is that there were these experiments, the, the double slit experiment, and the uh, I think it's called the, the Stern-Gerlach experiment that turned out these really puzzling results about the behavior of particles like uh, uh, electrons. So physicists are facing this experimental data and they're trying to re uh, reverse engineering, reverse engineer these data by coming up with mathematical models that can represent the data and possibly predict the results of new experiments. So that's what happened about 100 years ago. You had these really smart people who are kind of grabbing onto these different uh, types of mathematics, uh, complex numbers, um, vectors, and uh, matrices, of course, differential equations. And they are coming up with a way to, with these models that explain um, the experimental results. The problem is the models don't correspond to any kind of sensible physical picture of how the world works. So we've had a hundred years of, uh, of arguing uh, about the meaning of these um, mathematical models for quantum mechanics without any resolution at all. So the way I look at, at math now is that it is not the ultimate uh, language of nature, which is what people have been saying since Galileo. It's what a lot of modern physicists have said. Many scientists fetishize mathematics and they say that reality is mathematics to a certain extent, that uh, reality is this complicated geometric structure that evolves according to um, certain processes. 
And the way I look at, at science now, and this is a little paradoxical because I appreciate the power of the math more than I ever did. Um, but I see that uh, mathematics just provides another source of analogies and metaphors for, for trying to come to terms with reality in the same way that ordinary language does. Mm -hmm. Now, mathematics has given us extraordinary power to manipulate nature and to predict things. You know, it gives us our smartphones, it can help us uh, send satellites to uh, Mars, these extraordinary feats, but that doesn't, that, that is very powerful evidence that some of these mathematical models work. They're very effective, but that to me does not mean that they're true. And the way I look at mathematical models now is that we should always look at them with suspicion. We should never cling to them as, to, as if they're absolute truth. Uh, we should always stay open-minded and consider the possibility that there are many other possible models, maybe even an infinite number of mathematical models that can also predict experiments and lead to applications and do certain things for us. So I've, I've, I've got, I, I, I hate to use the word, but I've got kind of, uh, I'm drifting further toward postmodernism, uh, toward the idea that all our models of reality fall short in some kind of really important way. Mm. Well, you sound to me as an en enchanted skeptic, which is something I was thinking to talk about much later, but here you are fascinated by the maths and yet we, immediately with the caveat that let's not think that's the ultimate language of, of reality, which is something I also share. And, and you mentioned metaphors in, in biological sciences where I do a lot of, of the work that I do. Um, we often don't have the luxury to have equations as we used to do in physics. And that's even harder in, in, in mind sciences and consciousness, although there are a few theories of consciousness that are hardcore mathematic, as, you, as, as I'm sure you know, we can talk about this later. Now, now then there's this platonic structure uh, and this, this seduction of Platonism, like discovering that there can be a, a world of forms and mathematics um, that's in a way connected, but, but different than the concrete world, world we live in. This is another mystery to me. But let me, let me just dwell here for a moment and come back to quantum mechanics. So is your new understanding of quantum mechanics through mathematics what make you, makes you revise the thesis of the end of science? Or it's something new that has happened within the research in quantum mechanics recently over the last years that also gives you a glimpse. So is it more you um, re realizing what was done a hundred years ago, which is great enough, or has something happened in terms of empirical discovery or mathematical and, and theoretical advancement that, that makes you have made you more hopeful about the future it's, of science? It's kind of a combination of both. So when I started this quantum project to try to understand the mathematics underlying quantum mechanics, I tried to stay away from um, interpretations. You've heard the adage, shut up and calculate, which some physicists uh, recite when their students are getting too interested in the meaning of quantum mechanics, they say, look, just stick to the math and try to do the calculations. And maybe you can come up with an even more efficient uh, integrated circuit that can make our smartphones uh, faster. There's also the possibility now, um, there's a field that's just exploding uh, called quantum computing which is trying to harness some of the exotic quantum effects like superposition and entanglement to build more powerful computers. So that's part of the excitement that's going on. Then there's also, um, there's also all this excitement in what's called foundations of quantum mechanics. Uh, this is a field that was sort of more abundant for a while, but now it's, um, it's attracting a lot of attention. There are all these really smart people, physicists and philosophers, who are trying to understand what quantum mechanics means um, and what it might imply for our attempt to understand reality as a whole. One of the effects of all this interest is that there's a kind of uh, chaos 
and physics. Um, physics is very unsettled right now. This is also a problem that comes from some of the big particle accelerators seeming to reach their limits. They're not really, they're sort of confirming what we already know rather than leading to exciting physics. So all this is, all this going, all this is going on. And that, um, that's part of what makes me just kind of skeptical about anybody who says, uh, I know what's happening in physics. Mm -hmm. Here's what's happening. Here is how you should look at quantum mechanics and and the rest of physics. I'm I'm, I'm I get very doubtful when people speak with uh, certainty. At the same time, I learned, for example, I took a course in quantum mechanics at my university um, two falls ago, so like a year and a half ago. It was a very difficult course for me, I must say. So I was just sort of looking for things I could glom onto. One of the things that popped up, my professor just sort of said it in passing in uh, one of his lectures on the Schrodinger equation was that the Schrodinger equation provides an incredibly precise, beautiful explanation of um, a hydrogen atom, explaining how its uh, spectra uh, is produced and um, its overall behavior. But the Schrodinger equation does not provide an exact solution for the next most complicated, next uh, simplest object in the universe, which is a helium atom. A helium, a helium atom is an example of a three body problem, which can't be solved by the Schrodinger equation. So when, when the physicists, when, when my professor said that, I thought, I mean, I remember just sort of thinking, wait a minute, what? What did you just say? And then I asked him about it. Him, I, I asked him about it later, and I also looked it up on uh, Wikipedia. And I realized that a lot of physics consists of coming up with approximate solutions for complicated stuff. And as you know, the three-body problem is it, it pervades physics. It was a problem in classical physics as well. And so when you're trying to apply these mathematical models like the Schrodinger equation um, or Newton's uh, theory of gravity to the real world, yeah. um, the math gets really kludgy. Mm. You have to do all these things to, to figure out what's going on. So this realization, and I had others that were similar to that, plus my sort of journalist sociological observation of what's happening mm. in uh, physics led to this skepticism about reality actually being mathematical. Mm. And it's interesting because you merge um, quite remarkably the content and the context, right? Being a journalist, but also being immersed in the science, you dive into the content, but you're also able to zoom out and see the context of what's going on. Now, now when you say that physicists or physics is in trouble in a good way, because this is fascinating, interesting, when we're lost and, and they need some help, we need some help. I'm reminded of that famous quote, right? Don't, don't ask what physics, I would put it this way, don't ask what physics can do for biology or neuroscience. Rather, one could, I wonder if we could ask what biology and neuroscience could do for physics. You know, there's this, I, there's this implicit belief and I, and I, it, I, carried, I carried for many years that you know, when I was studying physics, I was, you know, I believe that those were the secrets of the universe and in a way they are, and you're trying to uncover them. Well, sometimes they handed them to you in a, in a book, so it's even better. But then I moved to biology and neuroscience, and I realized that, well, that's more the real world, as you, as you were talking about, living things, organisms, mind. So I want to I wanna move now towards, well, the mind-body problems, which is something you've written a lot about and you have a, pod, a podcast about, too. So how do we relate in a, in a rather Escher-like way when one kind of draws the other, these insights and, and troubles open questions of quantum mechanics to life and mind sciences with the caveat that in a way many people say, oh, déjà vu, it's the new age again, you know, trying to say that the brain is, a, is quantum or that there's entanglement, but there's serious research done that, that's trying to take that analogy seriously and concretely. So I wonder about this 
back and forth between mind and matter, physics and neuroscience and so on. Yeah, um, th so this is another uh, fascinating thing that's going on in, in quantum mechanics. I think the hope among physicists has always been that they can come up with a, a, a complete and objective picture of the physical world that doesn't require the complication of, of mind, consciousness, and things like that. And um, when you get certain sort of guru type figures uh, saying that quantum mechanics confirms the ancient mystical truth that uh, you know the, the universe consists of or requires mind, you know, they're dismissed uh, with scorn by lots of physicists. Yeah. But in fact, some of the greatest physicists of the 20th century um, acknowledged that mind is very get hard to get out of their pictures of reality. So John Wheeler, the great physicist at, uh, at Princeton, who was the mentor of Richard Feynman, he had this idea that reality is, uh, he called it participatory, that uh, reality emerges out of the interaction of, of, uh, of mind with uh, the physical world, that reality, the physical reality is shaped by the way that we look at it and interact with it. Eugene Wigner, one of the great quantum theorists, said the same thing back in, uh, in the 60s. Uh, he was looking at the measurement problem, which, which um, arises because of the fact that the behavior of an electron in something like um, the uh, double slit experiment or the stern gerlach experiment seems to be determined by our experimental arrangement, by how we observe the electron. There are some very popular interpretations of physics right now um, by uh, respectable, prominent physicists that make subjectivity part of the model. So one is uh, called cubism, which has been promoted by this guy, by a physicist named uh, Chris Fuchs. David Merman is a fan, another very prominent old school uh, physicist. Um, cubism says that quantum mechanics isn't really a theory about what exists. It's about what we believe about the world. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes subjectivity central. There's another um, interpretation I love called the uh, relational interpretation. This comes from uh, Carlo Rovelli, again, an excellent physicist and also a excellent writer. He writes really well about physics. And he says, you can't think of things as existing in themselves. Things only take on existence in their interaction with other things. And this applies to um, photons, to electrons, and I would say to human beings as well. Hmm. So it's, a, it's, again, it's an acknowledgement that you can't exclude mind from the system. So physics the mind body problem, which is about, it's a, it's, a, it's a question about the relationship between mind and body is right at the center of physics. Mm. It cannot be excluded. So that connects physics in really interesting ways to much of what's going on in you know, the obvious mind body fields mm. like, uh, like neuroscience. And it also connects physics to some of these ancient philosophical debates about the nature of consciousness and the mind-body problem. Again, this contributes to this volatility I've been talking about and this chaos. But for a journalist, when you're looking at all these smart people who are kind of wandering around, throwing ideas up in the air and arguing with each other, this is great stuff. Mm. It's really a, a, an exciting time to be a science journalist. Mm. Uh, I agree that these sensitivity, this realization has been going on actually for many years. Uh, Pauli and Jung and many, if not most of the quantum physicists, David Pitt and David Bohm here in Paris. I mean, the, this has always been in the air. And yet, as, the, as you were saying, there's this tension between kind of the guru-like um, heterodox proposal and the followers who want to believe but then there's the, the mainstream authoritarian um, kind of 
figure who says A is nothing but B. And then the role there seems to be for the followers, not so much to believe, but more to debunk what's going on. Like it's, it's an interesting back and forth. And just to insist, in molecular biology, in biology writ large, which, as you know, has been very much dominated by the molecular view, reductionistic, and so on. Well, they simply ignore quantum physics. It's like, whatever, it's like below the level we're interested in. So these are going to be our rules of the game. And now in, in, in cognitive science and in neuroscience, well, there was a recent review, for instance, um, in Nature Reviews Neuroscience, a couple of days or maybe a week ago. And it's very interesting. There were some theories discussed, integrated information theory, global neuronal workspace. And then there was a there was a note saying, well, not all theories could be discussed in this paper. Well, it makes sense. We need to choose what we're going to, we're going to discuss. So we're going to focus on these ones. There are many more. And then there are those that have to do with physics and then those that have to do with new physics. And we don't want to talk about those. You see, so still there's this resistance of saying, sure, sure, that was fascinating, especially if you were a physicist or took the trouble to learn the maths. But now we're just doing our own business um, with, with kind of a pre... 20th century philosophical uh, and scientific mindset in the sense of, well, we'll pretend, we'll pretend nothing of that existed and we'll do cutting edge mind and consciousness research in laboratories. So I wonder also from your, your sociological understanding, because you've interviewed so many prominent scientists, uh, how do you understand the human aspect of that we weird dynamics? Yeah, um, well, what comes to mind is there's, 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 you know, we're looking at human psychology here. I think to be a scientist, you have to have faith that you can figure things out, that you can look at the flux of nature and extract some kind of truth from it. And um, in some cases, there have been very deep, complex problems that do seem to have yielded truth, you might call it, like the, you know, the, the double helix, which led to um, the genetic code, which is a kind of solution to the problem of heredity, how genetic information is passed from one generation to another. The successes of science have led to this conviction on the part of many scientists, it's quite understandable that there is, when they're looking at some part of nature, there is a correct, true way to look at it. What I've concluded, and I, I used to see things that way too. When I wrote The Under, End of Science, I talked about, I used this term, the answer, which meant that the final true solution to the riddle of existence. Now, I'm, I guess what, I, what you might call a pluralist. I don't think for a lot of these problems and especially for the mind-body problem, I don't think there is a solution. When it comes to the mind-body problem, we don't even know what kind of science is relevant for solving the problem. We don't know what kind of language is relevant. Is it, is it particle physics? Is it, um, I don't know, some kind of chaotic, uh, nonlinear dynamics? Is it computer science? Should it be evolutionary biology plus some neuroscience? I mean, there are all these di different ways of looking at, at us, at human beings, and trying to understand all our complexities and the fact that we're physical beings, mortal physical beings, but then we also have all these complex uh, mental states that are associated with us at any time. I'm beginning to look, I, I work at an engineering school and I'm beginning to look at some of these deep scientific problems the way an engineer would look at them. So engineers, when they have a problem, they come up with a solution to, you know, some uh, like, a, like a bridge that has to span the Hudson or a new cell phone design and then they produce their design, their, their solution to this problem. You say, well, is this the true problem? I mean, the true solution? They look at you like you're nuts. It's a category error. No, mm. it's not true. It just works. Mm. And it's a kind of pragmatism towards some of these 
problems. When it comes to the mind-body problem and trying to understand the brain, judging whether a theory works can mean a lot of different things. Does it make sense? Um, does it help you understand schizophrenia or some other mental illnesses, inherited uh, diseases? Is it consoling? This is a big part of what's, what works. Mm. We're mortal creatures, we're all going to die, we all suffer. We want to look at the world in a way that can ease our suffering. So we're looking for consolation. Does, your, does the many worlds theory or super determinism or integrated information theory provide any consolation to you as a suffering mortal creature? Mm. Physicists, scientists, don't like when you bring in these kind of emotional subjective mm. considerations, but they're all subject to them too, mm. whether or not they admit it. Mm. So anyway, yeah, that's my view is evolving more and more toward, toward pluralism, mm. toward there being many possible solutions, uh, which we can latch on to for our own subjective reasons. What I'm trying to figure out is how you can have this kind of view, which acknowledges the importance, uh, the inevitability of subjective judgments of the world with an insistence that there is such a thing as truth. Mm. We, I, I don't want it to be anything goes because then that can lead to denial of climate change and denial that vaccines work and and to wild conspiracy theories. So this is what I'm trying to figure out right now, a way to have a, a, a view of the world that it has truth, a, objective truth is something that's possible while also acknowledging that there are all these different possible models for describing nature. Hmm. Well, there's a lot there, John, thank you. <laughs> Let's see where I begin to continue. Well, let's begin with truth, which is a, a big, a big topic and a big word. Um, I've been having a, 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 a series of discussions with Ian McGilchrist talking about truth, actually, his new book, The Matter With Things, is in a way, a way to get to tr a truer hold on reality. And I think he and many others, of course, we are wrestling with this, again, to avoid these two alternative force choice between the here there is objective reality and um, take it or leave it or any, anything goes, right? And so there are definitely cert certain things that are tr truer than others, right? Was it Wittgenstein that said that's true enough? It's beautiful, right? That, that, if that's, that's true enough. Now, maybe philosophy here, which we haven't talked about it yet, could really help us because we're trying to talk about an encounter with the world. And so, it, this encounter has all these isms that I like. I don't usually like all the words ending with ism, but has pragmatism, has pluralism, has perspectivism in a way. And this mention to consoling and, and human nature has to do with humanism, right? So, so two, let's say two questions here for you. One, in all these explorations, there's always beneath, as I call the operating system, which would be What's your metaphysics? Um, what's your philosophy underneath? Because you can have all sorts of phenomena and science and understanding of it. But really what's at the bottom is, it's maybe an implicit cosmology, like your understanding of the world. And so what's, well, what's yours? I was gonna ask it. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what's mine, but, but it, it's a very important problem as well for physicists and for biologists and for neuroscientists. What's there really the, the core beliefs about the nature of reality? And I think that also shapes what we are able and willing and eager to take or just dismiss regardless of the evidence. All right. Okay, I'll, I'll, I have a confession to make. Um, actually, this, this should be, this should be um, it's, it's not a secret to anybody who's, who's read almost anything of mine. Um, I'm an old hippie. I'm a child of the 60s. I grew up um, with this idea that uh, there's a way of looking at the world where everything makes sense. Um, this is enlightenment, this mystical uh, state of mind where everything suddenly becomes clear 
and it conveys not only truth, but also happiness. You can pursue this by meditating, by chasing after gurus, or in my case, my preferred method was um, taking psychedelic drugs. So I did that pretty avidly. Um, I still do it now and then. And um, the big truth that I've taken away from psychedelics, and I do think of it as a, as a metaphys metaphysical insight, it's actually an anti-truth. Hmm. It says that ultimately reality transcends any possible description we can have of it. Hmm. And that is a description coming from um, science, from physics, from molecular biology, from philosophy, um, from theology. Religions are all attempts to explain you know, the mystery of uh, existence, all of them fall short. There's actually a branch of theology called negative theology that I really like. Negative theology, um, the premise of it is that God cannot be described. That as soon as you describe God, you're wrong. Um, you've gotten it, you're making a mistake. Uh, and and yet then they go on to try to describe God. So they, they, they start with the premise that what they're doing is impossible, and then they go ahead and do it. Now, this is, I think, what artists all do without worrying about it too much. All artists, you know, if you're a poet or a filmmaker or, you know, a musician, uh, you are, you're not starting with the premise of, I'm going to create the final definitive poem that explains reality or the final definitive symphony or painting. That's again, it's a category error. You're saying, hey, check this out. Here's my response to the mystery. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And then we can have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, and, and that approach I think should apply to science. It should apply to theoretical physicists who are trying to come up with a final theory, a theory of everything, which is such an absurd but wonderful uh, phrase. Now, science has a certain power that the arts um, can't match, mm. a power to manipulate. The, I mean, you know, physicists, they, they gave us the hydrogen bomb, like it or not, and I don't like it, it's pretty impressive as an application of your um, of your model of uh, reality, and artists can't do anything along those lines. But just because of hydrogen bombs and smartphones and and lasers and things like that, that doesn't mean that physics is absolutely true. I think of physics is as a kind of art form as well. And by the way, I know that David Bohm is one of the inspirational figures for this, uh, for the foundation that you're part of, and for even these, these uh, conversations, David Bohm being the great quantum uh, physicist who died in the, uh, in the early 90s. And I spoke to Bohm about a month before he died. And he said, he talked about physics as a kind of art form. And he thought that there would be a fusion of science and art in the future. Uh, a recognition that they're both, when it comes to sort of understanding the world or appreciating the world, that both physics and, and the arts are trying to do the same thing. And I, I think that's a beautiful vision and, I, and it's something that resonates with me because of all my acid trips. Mm, and it resonates with me. Thank you, John, because I wasn't expecting to get to this point in, in kind of a bit more than half of an hour. Because you know, <laughs> if, if I had to, as a journalist, put a title to, if this was an interview and I was a journalist, uh, if I had to put a title, that's maybe clickbait, but it would be something like John Horgan ends the end of science by a rediscovery of the sacred, which is it's just honest and beautiful, but I'm not, I don't know if I'm putting words in your mouth, but it seems that that's what we're talking about. We are rediscovering the sacred and now people say, oh, what's the sacred define it? Are you talking about God, religion, all these allergic responses? But in any case, we're talking about the ineffable 
and, and the many ways in which we can do justice to it by participating in it. And this brings me to what was my intuition from the beginning by starting this series, which is probably the future scientist is going to be a scientist. It's going to learn maths, but it's going to be a poet and maybe a Buddhist meditator too, uh, or a European mystic, by the way, because you don't need to go to that far to the East to, to, to practice that, and an artist and so on. So is this, is this your late, latest, in a way, realization after so many years and, and hundreds of articles about all sorts of fascinating topics um, related to science? Well, you know, I should tell you that the very end of the end of science um, describes a mystical vision uh, where this, it was a trip where I, you know, it was a very powerful psychedelic, way more than I had expected. And I had all these visions and one was a vision of becoming this cosmic computer at the end of time, trying to figure out its own existence. And, um, and I, I, you know, I was that, co that cosmic computer, which is identical with what we might call God. And I couldn't figure out where I came from. I was baffled by my own existence and it triggered a, uh, an intense identity crisis. So I've been playing with these sorts of ideas. I call this scientific theology. This is a field that Freeman Dyson and others have, um, have been into for a long time. Um, I guess at this point, um, the main difference between me and other people who are looking for some kind of spiritual solace in, um, in science and maybe physics in particular is that I'm not an atheist, but I don't, I don't, I can't accept, I haven't found a theology that works for me. Yeah. I haven't found a picture of God that makes any sense to me. There's too much suffering and injustice in the world for me to believe in a God that loves us and wants the best for us and is all powerful. The vision of God that I came up with after this, this, uh, this big trip 40 years ago was, I, I basically decided if there is a God, this God is mentally ill and is undergoing a permanent identity crisis and hence creation with all of its beauty and joy, but also all its pain and suffering. Now, I realize that this theology of mine is just me projecting my own emotions onto the world. Uh, but as a, as a journalist, as a thinker, I really try to avoid wishful thinking. And a lot of the kind of spiritual interpretations of quantum mechanics and, and physics seem to me to be as guilty of wishful thinking as Catholicism, mm. the faith that I, I grew up in. I think Buddhism has some really serious problems. Buddhism, if you believe in karma, says that there's a moral order to the universe. Really, it's kind of hard to see that recently. Hmm. Uh, so I'm kind of, I'm an agnostic looking for answers to the purpose of the universe in the same way that I'm an agnostic about the mind body problem and about the meaning of quantum mechanics. Hmm. Now, what about unwishful thinking? And let me tie it out to scientific writing which you excel at and you're also as i understand a director of a center for scientific or for science writing it's called um what's what do you see is the role in the current and future science of in a way the mediator because we scientists do our our job sometimes well now more than before in the age of twitter and selfies we we, we do outreach but there's somebody which is the science journalist most of the time that's mediating between what the scientist knows and doesn't know and what the the larger population the lay people should know about that and in particular not only about the discoveries but it's very important now that we're talking about it how to convey that 
subtle intuition we're talking about, right? That, that, there's, that there's all of this at play. And it's not just about the new discovery or what science found, but what this all means in the context of, of human beings. So, so, so what's your thought, if I ask you about the future of scientific writing? And let me just tie it out with how I began. Sure, we shouldn't be proclamating wishful thinking, but I still see a lot of science writing and science, which is the same thing multiplied by minus one. You know, it's unwishful thinking as the default. Like we are nothing but these, we're kind of zombies. The universe is um, rather bad and mechanical, despite all the fascinating things we find. We may all, you know, be in a computer simulation. So, uh, well, some people are fascinated by, by that, but in any case, scientific uh, writing has, I think, a huge role to play in the future of science. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you. So what, how do you see the future of it? Uh, it's hard to say. Science journalism turned out to be the perfect career for me. When I was a kid, I loved science and I loved writing. I couldn't decide between them. And then I, you know, in my late twenties, I finally realized there was this thing called the, called science writing. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I thought originally I was going to, my job would be to convey the amazing discoveries of scientists to the public. And then I began to suspect um, maybe a decade into my career that scientists were sometimes bullshitting us, that they, mm. that they were telling us things that either weren't true or were very poorly supported by the evidence. And this was true both of theoretical physics when they're talking about multiverse theories and string theory, which have, have uh, no evidence, but also in the realm of uh, psychiatry, which I've written a lot about, and uh, theories of mental illness and uh, proposed treatments for uh, mental illness. Psychiatry is really a mess right now. So I've ended up being a very critical kind of debunking science writer, in part just because I don't think there's enough of that. Mm. So it's my job to be informed, to know what's going on in, in different fields and talk to a lot of the uh, leading figures in those fields, but then to reach my own conclusions about what's really going on, what we can believe and, and what maybe should be directed. Going back to your point about wishful thinking, this is, this is really important. It's something I've really struggled with. Um, you know, I'm, I like to think of myself as rational and I have my own reasons for doubting that there is a transcendent purpose to the universe. But also when I look at the world in my own life, it doesn't seem possible that it's here through sheer coincidence. Um, so I guess this is why I'm an agnostic. It depends on my mood, whether I'm tipping toward it atheism or tipping towards some kind of belief in, in uh, transcendent purpose, I also struggle with what to believe about the future of humanity. I've written a lot about war and mm -hmm. violence. I, one of my books is called The End of War. I'm trying to convince people to, um, to see war as a solvable problem because it seems to me that most people are fatalistic about war. And that helps perpetuate war. So I spent a lot of time knocking my head against people's pessimism about warfare. It's very difficult right now uh, for obvious reasons. Um, so I guess I'm just trying to say that this issue of wishful thinking, I mean, without wishful thinking, there would be no progress in humanity. You've got to have some kind of hope for a better future so that then you can set about trying to make it happen. Mm -hmm. But when does wishful thinking become delusional? Mm -hmm. That's the big question. And that's something that I wrestle with all the time. And I think a lot of other science journalists wrestle with it as well. Yes, we do. And we, we have our own inclinations and temperaments and, and theories. And we get attached to them, whether we try not to do so. And we invest in them. And then it's harder to choose they identify oneself from one's work. Uh, I think that's that's a, a pitfall of um, well, being a scientist in particular. 
despite the fact that, that the whole enterprise is set up to actually prove oneself wrong as quickly as possible as who was Feynman who said that to prove we should be trying to prove ourselves wrong as quickly as possible and and sometimes we do the opposite hmm. yeah so I, I was thinking how to wrap this up um, and and start the discussion with the rest of the audience uh, but you, you made so so many kind of humanistic comments that I'm I'm in a mood to just in a way leave it here um, and let you have perhaps some final thoughts. Because, you know, I and, and before that, let me say, I, I got to know you much better in this, <laughs> in this live conversation. You know, we had a previous, a previous Zoom and that's it. But I'm, I'm even more fascinated by your path because, and not to be too flattering about it, but it's what I see in you as we're talking is this kind of true inquiry like trying to figure things out and being very vigilant about what we're finding, but at the same time, enjoying the journey. And, and that's something very simple, but sometimes hard to get, even in PhD students, you know, who are in their first year of career and um, of scientific career. So, well, let me just say, I'm, I'm thankful for that, that, that you can convey that spirit. I think you did. And, and we need, we need a lot of that because then things are, in a way much easier and joyful. Well, I remark, because we were talking about the end of science and uh, it seems now it's turned into a kind of an endless pursuit. Um, but this should not be seen like, as a kind of Sisyphus myth where it's like, oh no, we thought we were close. And now it's like, it's probably never end because there are all these things and all these ways to look at reality and all these unknowns. And that I think can be joyful, can be a joyful trip, even though we are not guaranteed we're gonna get anywhere in particular. I wanted to end with these rather vague comments and, and, and thank you for, for this conversation. And, and perhaps you wanna close with some remarks. Sure. Um, thanks for having me on. I've really enjoyed this conversation too. Um, this idea of pursuing truth, even if you don't think truth is attainable, uh, is really important to me. As I said, I think it's something that philosophers and scientists are reluctant to grasp, uh, but artists get it. It's what artists do. You pursue the truth that you never quite capture it. Uh, for me, the payoff of this is, it's just been a wonderful life because it. I, I meet people like you who are also searching, uh, but all, but it, when it's working, you know, sometimes I just end up feeling stupid and confused and, um, and I get depressed. But when the search is working, this is one thing that's happened with my whole quantum experiment. It reminds me of how bizarre it is to be alive, of how beyond any possible explanation or theory or theology reality is every single moment this moment right now and right now every single moment of every single life is infinitely improbable that's what that's what i've concluded it, it's something that um some of my psychedelic trips have shown me and it's something that's confirmed for me by philosophy and science and the arts and and good literature over and over again we become you mentioned the term zombies we become zombies one of the worst things that can happen to us as humans is that we forget the miracle of existence that's right here in our face uh, we become habituated to it uh, but this search for answers to me constantly reminds me and keeps my eye on on this you know the strangeness of everything uh which can be very alienating sometimes but at the same time for me it's the most precious feeling that i can have i'm feeling it right now <laughs> thank you john thank you very much
Well, thank you both for this amazing conversation. And now we open it up to the rest of the group. If you would like to come in and ask a question or make a comment or just share something with the group, please do use the raise your hand function that you can find at the bottom of your screen under reactions or otherwise just physically raise your hand. And if I spot you, I will uh, call upon you. Shantana, come in, please. Hello. Wonderful talk. And um, I resonate with uh, so much of what you said, John. Uh, I'm also a, a child of the 60s and, and share some of the, that background. Um, one very concise uh, summary of, of this search or this exploration is the words of the old master Lao Tzu, who starts his book with the Tao that can be spoken about. It's not the Tao. Uh, with, with an important caveat that comes with it, which is not to make the Tao in, into anything substantial, because then you've lost it again. Uh, so that at the same time, uh, it's like being absolutely aware of the depth and vastity of the mystery and, uh, and Lao Tzu writes the Tao that can be spoken about is not the Tao. And then it goes on another 80 chapters about it. So do we. <laughs> <laughs> with, with endless delight and sometimes despair. Um, but that's, that's the wonderful, wonderful game that's offered us. So thank you, John. And, very hey, much. I'm glad you brought that up because, of course, there's there's an analogy to quantum mechanics. There, you know, Richard Feynman and others have said basically that if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you <laughs> don't. It's very similar to what Lao Tzu said, and um, and then yeah, then you say that, and then you go on trying to explain the mystery, which after having said that you can't explain it. <laughs> What else are we going to do? You know, to me, it's the great joy of life. And, and the idea that sh there should be a final definitive answer that ends our quest, this is something that I really dwelled on in the end of science, is actually a terrible idea. What would we do then if the universe was a solvable problem? If right. we ever do think we have found the answer to everything, chances are we, we will be deluding ourselves. I'd say the chances are infinite. By the way, that was something that David Bohm also talked to me about. He thought that the idea of a, of a final theory in physics was very dangerous because if Hawking and others thought they had it, it would block them from further investigations. So fortunately, there's no final theory in sight at this point, and we're just gonna keep searching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shantana. Carlos, would you like to come in? Uh, needless to say that uh, as others, I enjoy very much uh, this exchange. Uh, I read uh, your book uh, when it was published uh, it was very uh, inspirational as well. And at this point, I wish to ask you, uh, because you dedicated quite a bit of uh, uh, effort in that regard, uh, what is your view about biology? Is biology ending? Um, well, I think of uh, neuroscience as, um, as part of biology. Um, and neuroscience is, <laughs> I mean, we still don't understand how neural processes generate mental states. This is, this is um, a big part of the 
mind body problem. Um, I don't see that being resolved anytime soon. I mean, I, I wrote a book a few years ago called Mind Body Problems, Problems with an S. And I was arguing for this pluralistic view uh, saying that there are, I mean, at, at, the, at the extreme limit, every single person poses his or her own particular mind-body problem. Every single person has to solve that mind-body problem for himself or herself. And then because we all change, you constantly have to come up with, uh, with or might come up with new solutions as experiences um, change your, yourself and your picture of the world. Science, meanwhile, is progressing, neuroscience and uh, molecular biology and genetics. It's throwing out all these ideas at us about um, our biological selves and our relationship with the rest of uh, nature. No, I don't see, I don't see any resolution there as well. And I think that biology at some point is going to have to um, acknowledge that quantum mechanics might have some relevance to some of the questions that it, it wants to solve. So my, my view of science as a whole is much more open-ended than it was 25 years ago. Uh, if I could have a, a short follow-up. So you don't believe that uh, it is very dangerous what's going on in molecular biology with uh, these new techniques that uh, will allow us, I mean, not me at least, uh, allow scientists to uh, do experiments that are really very dangerous. Um, I'm, you know, I've ever since I started in science journalism, I've been hearing warnings about the power of genetic engineering to alter humanity and create uh, a race of super people. I'm sort of concerned about this because I know that the military, for example, is interested in this, uh, in this sort of research. It's, it just turns out that in spite of the human genome project um, and other efforts to, um, to turn genetic findings into medical applications, um, this research hasn't really amounted to much. The applications have been very disappointing. I mean, forget super soldiers and humans with an IQ of 500 and who are, are super athletes. I would just like to see a, uh, a, a theory of schizophrenia that actually works and treatments of schizophrenia that actually work. Um, so before we worry about some of the, you know, the kind of science fiction uh, possibilities of genetic research, you know, I want to see some of the, the beneficial applications in the realm of medicine and, uh, and psychiatry. Now, in, in, in addition to, to this and back to Carlos, and so, so we should be looking for new ideas, but I also find a lot of, again, joy and, and enlightenment even um, scratching to recover, rehabilitate, do some sort of archeology span of old ideas, especially in biology. There were amazing, insightful ideas at the beginning of the century, and they were just swiped away or put under the carpet um, due to some kind of prominent <laughs> ways of thinking about what life is. But all of that is there. Of course, some of it is not in English. <laughs> and, and even in Russian, I've learned that there's a lot of amazing research written in Russian during those years and in, in German too. So there's a huge task for, I would say, translators and philosophers of, of life to go back to those insights, which were incredible, and maybe bring them back in the context of what we can do and what we know now. And so in a way, the future of science uh, or the future of biology especially is also in going back to the past and recovering those lost arcs. I, I love that idea. Also, I, I wanna say that um, I'm a huge fan of a new book that just came out called The Dawn 
the dawn of everything, I think it's called, by an archaeologist and anthropologist. It became a bestseller. And it basically, it explodes our picture of the origins of human, of civilization, and just shows that it's been much more diverse and chaotic um, than, uh, than the conventional um, narrative would, uh, would tell us. It's also one of the worst things about biology and physics and science as a whole is that there is a tendency toward determinism, towards saying that things happen in lockstep and there are these physical processes that determine how we are and therefore we have to accept some features of life as inevitable, like let's say inequality between the races, inequality between uh, males and females, or um, militarism and warfare, that these are just a consequence of our biology and of evolution. That's bullshit and it's dangerous. I hate those ideas. And um, I would like to see uh, the kind of thing that you're talking about, Alex, just lead to an expansion of science's picture of the world. The dawn of everything makes a very explicit appeal to other social scientists to uh, not to be so close-minded in, in how they explain humanity and to uh, realize that there are more data coming in from, uh, in some cases, indigenous people who have become scientists and non-European scientists who've been marginalized in the past. All of this is really good, I think. Mm -hmm. Clara, would you like to come in? Hi, everyone. Um, really good to be here with all of you. John, thank you for your wonderful explorations, I guess I would say, um, of life. Because uh, that's what I think we're really talking about. Um, I, I'm a craniosacral therapist, biodynamic craniosacral therapist. And the way I see uh, healing, um, craniosacral therapy is a light hands-on uh, type of body work, is that in the way I understand it from uh, our forefathers that developed the work, is that um, energy and forces step down from the universe uh, into the human body. And we manifest that. So in, in some ways, we're completely connected with everything out there. That's my understanding. And during the pandemic, um, I was teaching and doing hands-on treatments uh, for people. I find it to be one of the most profound <clears throat> healing works I've ever known. I trained as a physical therapist, have taken every course under the sun to help people. And um, we went remotely during the pandemic. I teach this work also, and um, clients were saying, can you do this remotely? And I said, I'll try. And clients that I've been following for a long time were able to feel the same things that they could feel with my hands on from this distance. And in that regard, I, I saw some clients in Europe. I'm in New York City, so it sort of opened up the world. So my teaching partner and myself, uh, we had lots of other practitioners asking us, how does this work? Like, how do you do it? You know, and basically we follow the same principles that we would on a one-to-one, -one, you know, settling in the relational field, all these different things that we pay attention to. Um, and we decided to do a talk on remote healing and why and how it works. So I've been out of school for, you know, for 35 years. But I went back to try to study quantum mechanics, quantum physics, you know, all these wonderful ways to explain why this might be possible. My teaching partner did a wonderful talk on Aboriginal wisdom and how the Aborigines could communicate, you know, hundreds of miles away from each other just by communicating through there somehow. So we spent a lot of time putting together this wonderful talk. And at the end of it, I realized, you know, I brought in David Bohm's work, Sheldrake, a lot of wonderful scientists. Um, at the end, I realized that there's no way to explain how and why this works, basically. You know, I don't think there's a way, I wish there was, 
um, it would make sense, but it's more of a knowing that I have and that other people experience, which you can say is experiential, and that's not scientific de de data or mathematics. Um, but how would you speak to that, to the phenomena of um, that interconnectedness, uh, not from a neurobiology, not just from a spirituality, not from just quantum physics, like how would you, is there any way to grasp that at all and understanding of that? Because I, I would really like that. And I know there's probably not an easy answer to that because I haven't found it myself, so. All right, so I, I, I first have to tell you, I am in some respects, a really stuffy, old fashioned, skeptical scientific, materialist. I mean, I've written for Scientific American, for God's sake, for you know, like more than 40 years now. Is that right? No, that's too long, like 35 years. And, um, and I, you know, I, I, I try very hard to, um, to distinguish what can actually be experimentally confirmed uh, and what can't. So I'm very hard on a lot of scientists. Because I have this uh, this criterion. On the other hand, I try to be open minded. So I actually I know Rupert Sheldrake, and I interviewed David Bohm before his death. I I know some really brilliant people who have tried to find connections between, for example, quantum mechanics and um, parapsychology and precognition and telekinesis and and uh, you know telepathy and and some of these things, I'm personally either sort of agnostic or skeptical of these things. But I want to know more about them. I talk to other people about them uh, all the time. I haven't seen any plausible uh, explanations of them. I I can tell you that um, my girlfriend is is she's really into um, what I would call sort of alternative ways of looking at the world. <laughs> and and she, she's a very tough individual and she, she thinks I'm getting too stuffy and, uh, and skeptical and materialistic. She kind of knocks me around and tells me to loosen up. And, um, and I have, and it just means that I'm, you know, I, I just try to, I just try to be open-minded. There are all sorts of, there are experiences that I've had uh, that I cannot explain in a conventional scientific framework. So um, to me, this is just part of the excitement of what's happening in science and uh, in the world. I, I feel as though science is almost going back to how I imagine it was in the 60s and 70s when it was more like a wild frontier and there are a lot of crazy things going on and uh, scientists weren't nearly as kind of elitist and mean-spirited and closed-minded as they are today. Uh, and I, th I think this is good. It means there are a lot of ideas that aren't gonna pan out, but um, the process of searching uh, for new connections is really exciting to me. Okay, thank you so much. And if you ever want a remote session, let me know. I'd love to hear. <laughs> I offered one to Rupert too, you know, just I'd love to hear what people experience um, in their own bodies around this. So, okay. thank, and you thank you very so much. much. Thank, you. thank you, Clara, for bringing this in. And again, John, for your honest um, reply. I actually read today the, the interview you, you had with Rupert Sheldrake, and I marked a sentence that I was hoping to discuss, but then we went through other paths and that was great. And so you say, I conclude, um, I'm a psi, a psi skeptic because I think if psi was real, someone would surely have provided irrefutable proof of it by now. This is fascinating because um, I'm studying those phenomena too, in a way, rather in a closed way. And I'm, I, I sympathize with you and with Rupert at the same time. And I wonder myself, well, if William James was studying it. Come on, I mean, this is a serious, a serious precedent. And if there's been so many studies 
because if you if you look for them you find them there have been many studies of course there's a lot that's inconclusive that's poorly done badly written but in any case if there was just a a one percent that was true or true enough that would change everything and so here there are two more things to say at least one is as i'm studying this i realize how harsh the mainstream is on those scientific studies because for instance the the standards on statistics that are required let's say to prove quote unquote that a gene causes cancer are much much lower than the standards that are demanded um, for these studies to kind of hold to the sanction of mainstream science and so then we come across the infamous it's famous but infamous phrase from Sagan, right? The extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I think this has done a tremendous disservice to the inquiry. And one could add, well, extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary patience and extraordinary funding. And well, um, one can of course be very rational and justify it as Pinker and other prominent thinkers do with kind of Bayesian arguments. Well, my, my prior expectation of this happening is so low that no matter, no matter how much evidence you bring, the product of these two probabilities is gonna be zero, whatever you bring, because it's impossible to begin with. But it's subtle because if you grant it some probability, then it's how much evidence do I need to be convinced myself? I haven't solved it. I'm enjoying this mess, but I, I find it fascinating that, that, that Clara brings that in. And, and I think that's also where the future of science is in seeing how we at least get wet with these issues. I was gonna say resolve them, but not resolve them, get wet. Maybe there's a part that science cannot deal with it, great, but maybe there's a, par a part that science needs to just stretch itself to kind of reach this, maybe new, a new and upgraded scientific method because we know mind is intervening, we know intention might be at play. Who knows, maybe a skeptic running experiment is not gonna get positive results, because of because he's a, a, a skeptic, right? And so, well, um, it's going back for hundred years and 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 revisiting the operating system and that Bacon and others put in place. That should be great news to everybody. But we're so constrained, even when we write um, grants and we say this is cutting edge research. So we have cutting edge, and we have I call them cutting fringe. And I don't know who's at the edge. <laughs> um, uh, maybe there, there, there could be an integration of what we call cutting edge and cutting fringe, and we could do great things. I don't know what you think. Yeah, um, I, you know, because I, I'm, I sort of know people in the psychedelic community, and I, I'm interested in uh, mysticism, and so I, you know, I've gotten to know some people uh, who do uh, parapsychology research. Uh, Dean Radin, I interviewed going back about 20 years ago. And I, you know, as you say, I, I did a Q and A with uh, Rupert Sheldrake who immensely impressed me. Freeman Dyson is one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century, believed in psychic phenomena. He, I think his grandmother was one of the founders of the British Psychical Society. Uh, Alan Turing, another one. Um, so yeah, there's that. All I can say is that I, I have, I only have so much time as a um, as a journalist, and um, you know to to explore things. And I've just chosen not to go that deep in into uh, parapsychology. There's so many other things I want to write about that are more in the mainstream. I want to criticize those things. I'm more of a a critic and a debunker than a defender, if you know what I mean. So I'll leave it to you and to others to try to change the mainstream on this issue. I try to be open-minded. I, I, I'll talk to anybody uh, who seems smart and well-informed. Um, Stuart Kaufman is another person I've written about, a very uh, impressive co uh, complexity researcher who uh, had an experience that led him to, be, to believe in uh, precognition and uh, telepathy. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I want to talk to people like that, see why they believe that. But um, you know, I just haven't been able to cross that mm. that line myself. Let me briefly add the fact that you're not deplatforming them, but actually inviting them in conversation is, I would say, 
more than enough and you're doing a good job there too but just talking about those things from time to time thank you i i well, i enjoy it i mean i you know i like talking to buddhists who believe in reincarnation yeah, i like yeah. talking to catholics who believe in a and a, a loving, all powerful God. I, you know, I go, how can you believe that? Let's talk about it. All right, I have uh, Valjean. I see you, but Gary had his hand up first, and then I'll I'll come on to you. Okay, Valjean. Okay, Gary, please come in. Yes, thank you, thank you to both of you for all the work that you do, um, and John, particularly all the writing that you've done to popularize science. Um, I've put a lot of comments into the chat, um, but I just want to zero in on a couple of things. First of all, we have to, I mean, going back to a fellow by the name of Charles Sanders Peirce, who was a, the, found, the father of American pragmatism, who basically said that science is inquiry, period, inquiry of any form of, you know, of investigation. So you cannot, you cannot put science into a pigeonhole, right? I mean, you cannot confine science. In fact, he said that the first law of science is to not put an obstacle into the way of scientific inquiry. And that is exactly what scientism is doing, okay? We, we have sort of confined ourselves to a nominalistic perspective, which assumes that only reproducible results that are quantitatively expressible are acceptable. And that is false. That is a limitation that is unacceptable on the scientific process. And I think that's huge. That's huge because it, 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 for, it forces us into a way of thinking about ourselves in the world that is leading us to the, to the edge of catastrophe. <laughs> We are in the wrong mindset. I mean, and we are in the, the mindset that's going to lead us one way or another to the end of our species if we don't get smart in a hurry. Um, and the way we, how do we get smart in a hurry? Well, okay, so let's listen to what, you know, what, uh, what is quantum physics telling us? It's telling us that things are context dependent. Things are context dependent. That, you know, there is an element of science which we call, you know, scientism, where things are quantitative and where we are, we find invariant laws. But that's a very small area of inquiry and a limited area of inquiry. And it's a limited area of human experience, right? I mean, and to assume that the world works like, like Newton assumed, right? I mean, we know that it doesn't from Einstein, right? I mean, we, we've learned so much in the last, but we have to begin to apply it to our lives and to our civilization, I think. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest two books for you, for you to consider. One is um, Untying the Gordian Knot, okay? Process Reality and Context by Timothy Eastman. Okay, where Timothy Eastman talks about science as context dependent, context independent, and, con and context transcendent. Well, let's talk, I mean, inquiry in general, right? So there's, there's scientism, which is context independent, right? Where we look for invariant law. And then there's all the rest of science, which is subjective. Right, which, and there is something called interpretive phenomenological analysis, which is a way of looking at subjective experience and looking at some type of, you know, continuity, some type of consistency. And there's a great book by Jeff Kripal called The Flip, um, which, um, <laughs> which is the power of experience of, you know, of an experience that we cannot explain with science as we understand it. Can I, I, I want to interrupt you for a moment. Sure, I, please. I, I, I spent a week with Jeff Kripal at Esalen about 18 months ago and uh, great guy, really like him. He's a uh, philosopher of religion um, and we're interested in a, in a lot of the same things. And we actually had an online conversation 
if you just Google John Horgan and Jeff Kripal, uh, you can find it. And we talk about a lot of the things that we've been talking about um, here. I should just say that I'm, again, more of a, uh, an old fashioned scientific materialist, certainly than Jeff is, and maybe than you are, I still think we need science uh, to sort of ground ourselves when we're looking at certain questions. I mean, for example, in the realm of psychiatry, um, I think it's really important to rely on clinical trials, uh, and this is true of medicine in general for treatments for cancer, to rely on clinical trials to distinguish theories that are treatments that might actually helpful uh, be helpful from those that are bogus that are just based on uh, on anecdotes and physics also there are all these different theories string theory and multiverse theories the problem is they can't even conceivably be tested and so i don't think they should be part of the conversation or they should be put in a side category of i call it science fiction with equations um, so, you know, we need to figure out what we can preserve in science to give us some kind of grounding in reality when we try to understand things and, we tr and when we try to improve the world while also acknowledging, as you say, that conventional science is very limited in what it can do. But yeah, Jeff Kripal, great guy. I love his book, The Flip. One other um, book to, to consider is Ruth, Ruth Kastner's uh, The Transactional Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics Relativistic Treatment. It just came out in its second edition. Ruth has, um, I think, a very, very uh, insightful and important way of looking at the message that quantum mechanics is trying to get across to us, which I think, you know, to summarize is that everything is conscious. Everything is conscious for the purpose of agency and agency is for the purpose of communication. And communication is real, it's real. And our nominalistic understanding doesn't see that because it sees us all as monads without windows. We cannot communicate with each other as we are conceived of by Cartesian nominalism. We are monads without windows, as Leibniz says. We, you know, we, we are separate beings. And as separate beings, we are prone to destroy each other. We are prone to lean into self-preservation and ego. Um, and that's problematic because ultimately we are on this planet together. It's a little lifeboat. And if we don't figure out how to help each other out and how to recognize love as the primary motive, um, we're in serious trouble. And I'll end with that. Okay, Gary, I'm going to have to cut you off. Don't hate me. Val Jean, come in if you have a, just a brief comment to make. Okay, I'll try to make it brief. First of all, just so much appreciation for this for and for the previous comments of the participants who've come in. Um, I also, as Shantana said, child of the 60s, tried psychedelic drugs and had most extraordinary trip. And so I essentially... I lived my whole babyhood and childhood right up to five years old. And what I discovered was that I was just in a state all the time of complete wonderment, excitement, exploration, trying things out. And that's what all children do, but I relived it. And then um, I was living and working in Paris at that time and I came back to the States and came up to reality and, be see and meeting my brother who was the science editor of the New Yorker all those years that I'd been away. His name is Paul Berder, and he wrote two of many books, yeah, The Outrageous Misconduct and The Zapping of America. Right. And, uh, and he also grilled me on what I was doing in the CIA for those years in Paris. <laughs> okay, I just, um, I, I'll, I bet I'll just have to be brief about that. It's obviously a whole story, but, um, just thank you so much both for this. It's been uh, very interesting how you, and you've been so open and honest about talking about with things that aren't clear still. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I read your brother's work um, avidly uh, 
Yeah. I've, I've been reading The New Yorker for forever, and I remember Paul Brodeur's big series on uh, the effects of electromagnetic radiation on people. Yeah, uh, yeah that was a that was a uh, a blockbuster. So, yeah. uh, and I'm glad you survived the '60s as I did. Yeah. Hey, well, he's 92 now, and, he, and of course, years ago, he said, "I don't know how I ever wrote that book." <laughs> it was so. Cool. I have a feeling Ian McGilchrist would say the same thing. His remarkable books. How did I ever write all this and know all that? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I still got a few more books that I want to write. So oh, I'm not quite yes. at the end of the line yet. Look forward to them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have gone two minutes over time. I have Michael with his hand patiently up. Can we just let him come in a second and make his comment? Is that okay with you guys? Okay with me. Yes. Come in. Awesome. Thanks so much for everything here. I have a question. Um, in the, have you considered the role that language plays, even language in the sense of mathematics? Because most of the mathematic, modern math, not so much classical geometry or something like that, but it works on an assumption of separation. And then our language, if you look at a dictionary, Barfield talks about this, uh, Owen Barfield, where if you open a dictionary, it's these cross references. So we never really say what something is. We're more talking about what something is like. So my, where the realm I play in is history of science and then looking at is the language that we use or the languages that we are using kind of constraining us and kind of blinkering us or putting blinders, kind of putting blinders on. So. You've, I, well, if I, if I may, you've of touched course. on what is becoming one of the major themes of the book I'm writing on quantum mechanics. This is a book that I'm going to be talking about in my book. It's, um, it's by Douglas Hofstadter, you know, the great polymath who wrote Gödel, Escher, Bach. And this is a book that he co-wrote. It's not the best written of his books, but it's got a profound theme that's related to what you just said. It's called, the, the title is Surfaces and Essences. And it's basically about how we can only know things through analogy. Um, we say, you know, we're trying to understand this thing. We say, well, it's sort of like this thing over here, that thing over there. And what the scientists say is that, yeah, that's how ordinary language works. But with mathematics, we're getting to the ground of being. We're getting to the true language that goes beyond analogy. And my working hypothesis is that that's wrong, that uh, mathematics also works by analogy. And so you've got this network of things that are all in relation to each other and that are uh, this kind of self-enclosed enclosed system of uh, language. And this applies to art, to philosophy, to theology, to ordinary descriptions of the world and to mathematical models. And then you've got reality over here which to a certain degree isn't really touched by any of these analogy systems. So I'm glad you got in your question because it's like, that's something I've been obsessing over just recently. Sorry, Michael, I had to mute you because of the audio problems. So we can't hear you right now, sorry. You want me to go? Yeah, go ahead. I we couldn't oh, hear. Okay. No, no, no. So, so for me, the question is that I that I, is there another type of math based on wholeness? Um, and I've gone down the Platonic route and geometry, mm. and even some of the alchemists, which would say how you conceive of the number two makes all the difference in the type of science you come up with. It's two, one plus one, or are you starting with a hole and cutting it through division, almost like a cell undergoing mitosis? Uh, just 
off the top of my head, I'd say um, I understand the search for the, I don't know, the true, the true language system, which might be a mathematical system or a system of logic. Um, but I'd say that this is an effort that is doomed to fail and that um, we, we will, I think you can look at human intellectual, scientific, philosophical, artistic uh, history as an effort to find the right language, to find the language that finally captures things once and for all, but that, and we find new analogies and, and new systems. Quantum mechanics is an amazingly powerful, evocative model of uh, reality, but all of them ultimately fall short in some way. That's, that's I would agree with you. My conviction. That, yeah, from uh, computer programming, there's the idea of a domain language. You can describe certain things with a language, but never like everything. So, I know we're over cool. time, but I know we're over time, but let me just add one, one thought or a chain of thoughts on this. So there's that movie whose title I forgot of this, it's called The Encounter, like where well, there are these kind of um, these beings from another planet come and they're making these drawings, right? To communicate. And there's a linguist, if I recall, and a physicist, and they're both trying to solve how to communicate. And I think the physicist fails and the linguist uh, has a better success. And so, well, this question always, always not, but often comes at the end of, of, of our discussions here about language, about maths. Language has some sort of bad press, at least amongst scientists, because we use it only to kind of very accurately and objective just report what we found. And if we are lucky enough to use maths, then that that's, lo looks like a, a, a low, like a more grounded kind of real and uh, language. But real language, human language, works as, as much to reveal as to conceal. It's very interesting. I, I like to think of language as modeling. You make a model. And so a model by default decides some things you're going to ignore and some things you're going to amplify. And language that does this all the time, and, and it's great. Now, there are many ways to use language. And so we've talked previously about phenomenology with Michel Bitbol, and also poetry comes to the, to the picture often, and with relationship to all these kind of self-reference, referential nature of words and, and meaning, when another P that's not phenomenology and poetry is this idea of process relational and metaphysics, which by the way, have to do with, with the book uh, by, by Timothy Eastman that was mentioned before. So, well, it's just, a, I see the language is a, is a precious jewel and it's, it's as much of a mystery as, as the mystery we've been talking about, like mind and matter, why and how it can do what it can do. Um, Absolutely. I, I, I um, you know, one of my favorite philosophers is, he's kind of maligned these days, but it's still uh, Thomas Kuhn. Sometimes I, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to Thomas Kuhn. I, I interviewed him for my book, The End of Science. And I, I sometimes thought that Kuhn didn't fully understand what he was saying himself, but I saw him as a, as a philosopher of language. And he is saying that we have paradigms, which are really language systems, which define the world in certain, uh, in certain ways. And, and then we realize that that language system doesn't work anymore and we shift to a new language system in which the terms are defined or there are entirely new terms and these paradigms can be very powerful can help us do a lot uh, in terms of understanding the world and manipulating it but ultimately they all fall short of reality whatever that is and back to Bohm, right with his Rio mode all these attempts to kind of um, hack language to be able to make it express more than it actually does right now. So let me just add one quick thought is that language is not a set of rules that it's there. We can invent new rules and maybe make it evolve so that it can tell more things that it actually does. So that's also interesting. It's not like a fixed set of rules and let's see what we can do with it. And probably it's, it could be evolved. Okay. Now, I just have to mention one more thing. One field that really fascinates me and that I think could blow physics wide open and possibly science wide open, but it also could be a total bust is quantum computing. So I know some people in the field of quantum computing. I think within the next five years or so, we should realize, we should know whether or not quantum computing is really going to amount to anything. 
I'm worried about it because there's a lot of military money going into it. There's a like an arms race in quantum computing right now. That bothers me. What's good about it is that it could lead to the testing of certain ideas in physics, our, our concepts about um, quantum mechanics that then creates a positive feedback effect. It generates more ideas, which then we can test further and even more powerful quantum computers. And out of this positive feedback effect could come something truly revolutionary or not. Thank you. Thank you both so much. What an excellent session. So incredibly lively. This has been really, really great. Thank you, John, for coming today, for, for being here with us and for bringing a totally different perspective to the series. So excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for curating this series, for inviting John. Um, the next session in the series will be on Wednesday, June 15th. Um, I'm going to put the link in the chat for everybody. Uh, Alex will be in conversation with Yamena Canales, who is an award-winning author and scholar. So this should be an incredible session. So we hope to see you all then. Thank you everybody for being with us here today. And we will see you again soon here at the Pari Center. Bye, everybody. Take care. Thank you. So Bye, much. everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Alex and Eleanor. Really great to meet you. Thank you, John. Thank you for being here.